Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Wohler for Integrated Medicine Academy, or from Integrated Medicine Academy, I should say. And this is for Great Plains Laboratory. I want to thank them again for providing this opportunity to share this information and then also just thank them as well for their ongoing support for education for all of us for so many years. So what I thought I would do in this talk is discuss this particular chemical, tigalyl glycine. And this is a marker that you will see elevated from time to time, fortunately not real common, but from time to time on the GPL tox profile, the non-metal chemical profile that Great Plains has. And, you know, we can look at it from just a basic standpoint and say, well, it's elevated because of, you know, primary chemical exposure. And that very much is true in many cases. So what I thought I would discuss is some other possible reasons of why this marker can be high. And these are just things to think about clinically in your practice, because ultimately what we're doing with these tests when we see markers like this that we may not at first glance understand why they're elevated is to always think clinically and critically about what could be some reasons for their elevations. So for those of you who have heard, not heard me speak before, I've been an integrative and functional medicine physician since the late 90s. I've done a lot of clinical education for Great Plains Laboratory, teaching specifically their organic acid test seminar. And I've also been involved in doing these free webinars through Great Plains now for many years. I also have my own academy called Integrative Medicine Academy, which I'll talk about later. I'm also the medical director of a healthcare practitioner membership site called Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds. And then in my own practice, I've worked for years with individuals with autism. Let me go back, excuse me neurological problems, autoimmune diseases, et cetera. And I've done a tremendous amount of speaking. I've written a number of books and I'm also a practicing clinician. So the toxic non-metal chemical profile is an interesting test because it contains you know, a lot of different chemicals that all of us can be exposed to from the organophosphate pesticides to phthalates to styrene to pyrethroid insecticides, et cetera. But the last marker, I think often tends to get overlooked, this tigalyl glycine, which is actually a marker for mitochondrial damage often caused by toxic chemicals. So let's talk about this a little bit more in depth. And so here's the marker, right? It's the last marker on the GPL tox profile. And it doesn't show up elevated that often. Now, I would say in all the GPL tox tests that I've analyzed, probably between five to 10%, maybe, you know, maybe we can just say 10% of the time it's, it's, it's elevated. Uh, you might see it a little bit more elevated in your practice, depending on your patient population, but know that it is linked to mitochondrial problems that could just be mutations in the mitochondrial DNA, or it might manifest from toxic chemical exposure, or a lot of oxidative stress, for example, nutritional deficiencies, inflammation, these types of things. And so at a minimum, what we can do is support patients with good nutritional supplementation that, that have different nutrients, CoQ10, biotin, antioxidants, these types of things to just support nutrients at the cellular level. Now, one of the things to keep in mind about mitochondrial function is that you know, we burn carbohydrates, fats, proteins, or I should say we convert these things into utilizable energy in the body to make ultimately ATP through the electron transport chain. And we also produce some ATP through glycolysis within uh, the cell as well. Now, the primary fuel source is fats, where we get most of our metabolic bang, so to speak, and we also burn carbohydrates. Proteins are interesting is that their primary purpose is not to provide a fuel source. They will do that because there are pathways that lead into the mitochondria for certain amino acids. But the primary role of proteins really is to reestablish protein stores for other purposes, but we do use protein certainly for energy production. But ultimately, if you look at things, 
from carbs, fats, proteins, it's sort of most of these roads metabolically lead to the mitochondria. So it's sort of like the end result here is to produce ATP. And it obviously from a biochemical standpoint could get more complicated than that. If we look a little bit deeper at the mitochondria, we notice that there are two membranes. We have an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And between the outer and the inner is this intermembrane space where we get an accumulation of hydrogen ions, or essentially a proton, that accumulates in that intermitochondrial space, creating an electrical gradient differential between the intermembrane space and the matrix of the cell. So that eventually when we get a bunch of these hydrogen ions accumulating over the last complex, sometimes this is called complex five or the ATP synthase, we get an influx of hydrogen ions and that influx causes a twisting motion of this ATP synthase complex that brings together inorganic phosphate and ATP ADP to make ATP. So ATP is our cellular energy currency that's used throughout our body. In the matrix of the mitochondria is our Krebs cycle, also called the citric acid cycle. And there's a couple of connecting points off of the Krebs cycle that engage what's called the electron transport chain. So that would be complex one and complex two. So this is a different view. So here is complex one and here's complex two. So this is one, this is two. And ultimately what's happening is, is that as, we're, as the cell or the mitochondria is pumping out these hydrogen ions into that inner membrane space, we're also getting movement of electrons, okay, through chemical reactions across these different complexes. And so that would be sort of the simplistic way of thinking of it. We're basically transporting electrons through this chemical chain reaction. Okay, and so you're getting this movement in that direction. You get a pumping out of protons. And of course we get those protons accumulating over top the ATP synthase. They, they flow through. That causes a twisting motion in essence of these bottom oval shaped proteins, and that brings together our ADP and inorganic phosphate to make lots of ATP. But we engage these, this transport chain through these different complexes. Okay, so complex one and complex two primarily, and these are what links back. We could think of these two guys linking back to our Krebs cycle. And so it's possible to have different genetic problems in each of these complexes certain toxins can affect these systems as well. So let's look a little bit closer at NAD+, what's also called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide is a chemical that is very important. It's involved in many different types of enzyme reactions from a metabolic standpoint. And depending on the biochemical reaction it's involved in, it can either be NADH being converted to NAD or NAD plus being converted back to NADH. So this would be the oxidized form. Here would be the reduced form. And that occurs through transfer of electrons and a hydrogen ion. And to take a little bit of a more of a deeper look at where NAD comes into play is that we actually create some NADH through our Krebs cycle, right? So NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide gets converted to nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide hydrogen by different chemical reactions in our citric acid cycle, also called our Krebs cycle, right? So we've, the conversion of isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate produces it, conversion of alpha-ketoglutarate to succinyl coenzyme A produces it, as well as the conversion of malate to oxaloacetate. And then we know that, in essence, that NADH acts like a, a chemical bridge, if you will, that's kind of the way I look at it, between the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, but 
it does so specifically at complex one. Okay, because there's a number of different complexes that are part of that chain reaction within that inner mitochondrial membrane. And you can see, right, that fats, carbs, and proteins funnel down to the level of acetyl coenzyme A to enter the Krebs cycle that ultimately gets transferred over to become ATP, the adenosine triphosphate, which is the cellular energy currency that runs the machinery of our cells and our body, whether it's our digestive system, whether it's our nervous system, immune system, et cetera. So if we take a little bit of a deeper look at this particular chemical, tigalylglycine, it actually has a link to complex one of the electron transport chain. And so it can be elevated when there are problems or disorders within the electron transport chain. So things that would inhibit complex one, but there's also other inhibitors that can affect other complexes that might also influence this chemical to be elevated. That could be genetic, that could be nutritional, that could be toxic. But that's not the only thing that will cause tigalylglycine to be elevated. There are some genetic disorders that can elevate it as well. Now, the reason it's on the GPL tox profile is because it has a strong association with what's called respiratory chain problems or disorders, basically things that are causing damage within the electron transport chain. Most of the time it's chemical based and that's why the tigalylglycine is actually on the GPL tox profile. So other mechanisms that could elevate this chemical occur because of, again, respiratory chain problems, but we could also have other enzyme deficiencies. One specifically called 2-methyl-3-hydroxybutyryl coenzyme A dehydrogenase. And it gets affected because we have a problem in utilizing or converting uh, NAD or NAD plus because of damage happening within complex one of the electron transport chain. So if we take a look at this particular slide, I've used this in other lectures. Isoleucine is a type of amino acid that gets converted, but ultimately where I want you to focus your eyes right now is right here at this complex. So we've got NADH to NAD plus, right? And we know that that reaction takes place in complex one of the electron transport chain. So if this is damaged, okay, we can't make enough NAD plus. And if we can't make enough NAD plus, that is going to compromise the ability to convert this chemical, 2-methyl-3-hydroxybutyl coenzyme A, into this chemical down here, 2-methyl-acetyl coenzyme A. Right? So then that reaction gets compromised. And what can ultimately happen is we get an increase of a chemical called tigalyl coenzyme A that manifests as an elevation of tigalyl glycine off of the GPL tox profile. And so this can go up and up and up depending on what's leading to problems downstream? Is it a problem in the mitochondria with regards to complex one? Or there are a few other reasons it could be elevated. And that is, is enzyme deficiencies that either make this chemical convert to this chemical or 2-methyl-acetyl-coenzyme-A convert to acetyl-coenzyme-A and propanyl-coenzyme-A. Now, before we leave this slide, I just want you to focus and, and appreciate where this is going. Notice that acetyl coenzyme A is a production or a product of isoleucine metabolism. Well, we know that acetyl coenzyme A goes off to the Krebs cycle. Propanyl coenzyme A is interesting because it is also a product of this reaction. 
and it is linked to a chemical called succinyl coenzyme A. We'll come back to that later because this guy is also within the Krebs cycle. So isoleucine is one of nine essential amino acids. It's also one of three branch chain amino acids along with leucine and valine. So here is isoleucine. It's got a carboxylic acid plus an amine group, an extra, and then we'll get two methyl groups off of different carbons. And there are many foods that contain isoleucine or, are, or at least store isoleucine, eggs, chicken, turkey, seaweed, proteins, soy protein, excuse me, fish, cheese, et cetera. So isoleucine is considered both a glucogenic, which means it can form glucose, and a ketogenic, which means it can form ketones by the breakdown of fatty acids and ketogenic amino acids. And this was an interesting slide in that it, it shows us which amino acids are generally tend to, uh, tend to be purely glucogenic and which ones are ketogenic and which ones are both. So isoleucine is both ketogenic and glucogenic. And because it's glucogenic, meaning that it can form glucose, there's the possibility of prolonged elevations or excessive levels that it could eventually lead to insulin res resistance, just like having too high blood sugar, for example. And if you stare at this particular image, you get an appreciation that there are a number of entry points into the Krebs cycle. succinyl coenzyme A, fumaric acid, oxaloacetic acid, alpha-ketoglutaric acid. And there's a number of things feeding into it, but you'll also notice that oxaloacetate or oxaloacetic acid can also peel out to become glucose. So anything that comes into this pathway that is glucogenic gets converted to oxaloacetic acid, which becomes or can become glucose. And so that is the, in essence, the glucogenic connection. But you also notice there are certain amino acids that feed into acetyl coenzyme A or acetyl coenzyme A, however it, you wanna pronounce it. Acetyl coenzyme A, I think is the most appropriate way. And notice that isoleucine is part of that equation, right? And so acetyl coenzyme A then enters the Krebs cycle, okay? Ultimately kind of spinning around. And then of course we produce the NADH that gets sequenced over to the electron transport chain to produce ATP. So, Elevations of tigalylglycine would most commonly be linked to just problems within the respiratory chain. Okay, toxic chemicals would certainly be high on our list, and that's why it's on the GPL tox profile. Oh, excuse me. Okay, and so that would be the sort of the, the most common type of scenario is just issues happening within the respiratory chain or the electron transport chain. And so when we have a particular patient, like this one here, I actually used this case uh, in a previous lecture I did through the GPL webinar service. This was a 59-year-old female postmenopausal with chief complaints of weekly headaches, fatigue, problems that have been de developing over you know, the past decade or so, doesn't get, is improved with rest, for example. And she's having some mesh memory issues and some anxiety and moderate depression, you know, since her mid thirties. And she's on a number of meds, Lexapro, Indorol, daily aspirin, and then just some local box store multivitamin and calcium magnesium. And there's a history of hypertension. And then an individual also has a history of some surgeries, gallbladder removal, right? Ingle hernia repair. Uh, and was a smoker for many, many years, has since quit, um, but you know, three to four glasses a week of, of wine per week, excuse me, and then some moderate exercise. And for the most part, physical exam is unremarkable as far as any major issues. 
And when you look at the GPL tox profile, what you notice is that there are some chemicals that are really, really elevated. If, you, if you've used this particular test, you know that levels above the 95th percentile are felt to be significant with regards to a person's underlying health issues. It's not to say that they, it was, it's the only reason a person may have problems, but it is a definite contributing factor. And so this individual has the 2-hydroxy isobuteric chemical that's linked to MTBE for, as a gasoline additive that is extremely high. It's essential nervous system, peripheral nervous system toxin. It's carcinogenic in many animal studies, damages the liver, damages the kidneys, et cetera. And then combine that with the phenylglyoxylic acid, which is styrene, plastics, car exhaust fume, fumes, excuse me, also a central nervous system toxin. This level is also very high. As we go through the rest of the test, there's not anything really elevated in the next section. We get a little bit of propylene oxide elevation, which is often linked to plastics or like a fumigant in uh, food wrapped in plastic, basically. But then we've got elevated acrylamide, elevated 1,3-butadiene. Okay, by the way, all of these chemicals are, can, could be elevated in somebody who's a, who's a smoker as well. So we can see that there are some fairly significant elevated chemicals in this individual. Uh, slight elevation of organophosphates, nothing to speak of with regards to the 2,4-dichlorophenoxic acetic acid or the pyrethroid insecticides. But they have a very elevated tigallyl glycine. Okay, so we know at a minimum we've got some chemical exposures that most likely are causing problems at a mitochondrial level. And so one of the things that we can do sort of therapeutically is try to track down the source of those chemicals, whether it's coming from lifestyle, whether it's coming from occupational exposure, foods that they're buying, environmental factors, for example. And then through things like detoxification and sauna therapy, et cetera, water filtration, we can lower those levels over time. But we can also do a number of supportive nutrients for liver function, for cell function, antioxidants, et cetera. And even though these are rare, really where I wanna focus our attention now are on a few other reasons that tigallylglycine might be elevated. It doesn't mean it's elevated or that these are the pure cause in everybody. I think by and large, these are tend to be more rare and much more likely that our patient's gonna have tigallylglycine elevations because of chemical exposure and oxidative stress. But one of the interesting things about, you know, fragile, cell metabolism, and that would include mitochondrial function, is that sometimes we'll have individuals who are asymptomatic, they might have an underlying, let's say genetic vulnerability, but it's not until they're stressed or provoked or compromised in some way that that problem fully manifests. I've seen this now, for example, with individuals who have problems in dopamine metabolism. You've heard me speak before about dopamine metabolism and the dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme that we often look at and see off the organic acid test. Well, this would be no different in that sometimes people's problems manifest after severe reactions to vaccines or a severe infection, for example. And that's very true of kids who have underlying inborn errors in metabolism, where they may be seemingly healthy until they're challenged by the factors in their physical environment. So the organic acid test can give us some insight into mitochondrial dysfunction. So looking at the uh, glycolysis or glucose metabolism, where we can have problems or elevations of things like pyruvic or lactic acid, factors affecting the Krebs cycle, succinic, for example, or citric acid, 
Succinic is often elevated in chemical exposure too. Citric acid is often elevated with a glutathione deficiency, for example. And then certain amino acid metabolites, 3-methylglutaric, 3-hydroxyglutaric, 3-glutaconic acid. 30 and 32 are actually linked to what's called leucine metabolism. 3-hydroxyglutaric is linked to lysine amino acid metabolism. And so when you step back and understand about how certain amino acids can funnel through these different pathways to help form acetyl coenzyme A, to help form succinyl coenzyme A, you can appreciate, as I mentioned before, that most roads metabolically lead to the mitochondria and that these two guys right here have a direct connection to our Krebs cycle. So yeah, we can use amino acids for energy production. It's just that the primary purpose of protein is to sort of rebuild our protein stores. And I guess you would say maybe these are sort of secondary influencers on Krebs cycle activity. So let's focus on isoleucine because this one is, is the one that is most specifically linked to tigalyl coenzyme A, which becomes tigalyl glycine when we have some kind of block downstream. If you go to the National Library of Medicine under their PubChem website, it's incredibly in-depth. You can look up almost any chemical and look at its chemical structure, its, its chemical nature, associated diseases and disorders. Um, there's more on this website than you probably know what to do with. But certain problems in isoleucine metabolism can be linked to ketosis, to what's called propionic acidemia, beta th uh, ketophthalase deficiency, and then this 2-methyl-3-hydroxyl-butyryl coenzyme A dehydrogenase deficiency. We're going to specifically focus on these two right now. So this goes back to this particular paper that was being profiled earlier from clinical chemistry and molecular pathology. So tigloglycine um, being excreted in respiratory chain problems, but could also be elevated because of a deficiency in this thiolase enzyme or this dehydrogenase enzyme. And so before I move on, just take a look and, and understand that NADH, okay, becomes NAD plus through reactions of complex one of the respiratory chain. So all of this is happening within the mitochondria, okay? And we need that NAD plus in order to act to help convert the 2-methyl-3-hydroxybutyryl coenzyme A to the 2-methyl-acetoacetyl coenzyme A. So if this is messed up, this gets messed up, meaning that gets messed up, okay? And that can cause, also cause our tigalyl glycine to elevate. If this enzyme, this up here, all this could function just fine, but if we've got a genetic mutation here with this thiolase enzyme, that too could cause the tigalyl glycine to elevate. So what they found in this particular paper was they looked at 44 controls, 21 kids, six adults, five newborns, and then they compared that with um, ill patients, essentially people with known metabolic problems. So propionic acidemia, for example, or this thiolase deficiency, or who had a, a number of different disorders affecting the electron transport chain. So this would be our electron transport chain, complex one, complex one through three, complex one and four. By the way, complex one and four are often damaged in autism. Pearson syndrome is a mitochondrial defect with poor growth, anemia, neutropenia, as well as lactic acidosis, but it's, it's not real common. One in a million live births, right? So it's not something that we will commonly see, but understanding that there can be obviously genetic defects or issues that happen in the mitochondria that could be reflected elsewhere. So 
beta ketothiolase deficiency, that is this enzyme right here, this thiolase deficiency. It's probably the easiest way to remember it. And you'll notice that it's important in that it helps to, to convert 2-methyl acetyl, or acetyl, excuse me, 2-methyl acetoacetyl coenzyme A into both acetyl coenzyme A and propanyl coenzyme A. And these two guys right here have a direct relationship to our Krebs cycle. Now, this thiolase deficiency is more common, for example, um, in that one in a hundred thousand births. But again, that's you know not a lot. For example, um, phenylketonuria, which is typically tested for in newborns, is one in ten thousand live births. And a lot of these problems, these metabolic problems at this level, tend to cause what are called ketoacidotic attacks, where you know issues emerge, um, you know either because of a genetic problem or infections stress the system, or there's some kind of nutritional deficiency, for example, or there's an excessive intake of a certain food, like excessive intake of isoleucine to protein sources that we know can't be properly met, uh, metabolized because we've got enzyme problems that just don't convert one step to the next. By the way, the vast majority of these, these genetic disorders also too manifest with very severe neurological problems in these kids. This is just another viewpoint, right? So isoleucine getting converted to 2-methylbutyryl coenzyme A that gets converted to tigalyl coenzyme A. And we do get some production through glycine attachment to become tigalyl Of course, if we block this thiolase, that's going to cause these other things to build up, okay? And then this is measured as a, you know, in generally very high levels, the more severe this block is. But again, just notice that this is heading towards the Krebs cycle, right? So again, it's isoleucine, whether it's isoleucine, whether it's valine, whether it's leucine metabolism, it's all heading towards supporting energy production. This particular one, I actually couldn't find any information on its incidence, it's, it, I think for the most part, it's fairly rare. This is another severe neurodegenerative disorder that can occur in children by a defect in this 3-methyl-3-hydroxybutyryl coenzyme A dehydrogenase enzyme. So this is the enzyme that converts this coenzyme A, this 2-methyl-3-hydroxybutyryl into 2-methyl-acetoacetyl coenzyme A, right? So that's what's doing that. This is helping to convert it here. And this enzyme is dependent on NAD+. Okay, so probably in, 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 in total, if this were to occur, this might be maybe a slightly more common problem. But again, the most common problem of elevations of tigaloglycine is damage of complex one purely happening in the respiratory chain because of toxic chemical exposure, or oxidative stress, for example. Now, a lot of times, as I mentioned before, these things can be worsened with excessive intake of certain proteins. So kids who have these genetic disorders don't do well with, with certain food sources. So kids, for example, wouldn't do well with eating excessive amounts of protein that contain the isoleucine. So a lot of times they'll have to go on low protein diets so that their system isn't overwhelmed because any one of these chemicals, for example, adds to the acidic pool. Then of course we can get build up of other organic acids like lactic acid, lactic acidosis, which has its own damaging effect, driving acidity in the body. And that certainly can have an adverse effect on a developing brain and nervous system in these kids. Okay, so a beta ketothiolase or just a thiolase deficiency, we could also go upstream from that. 
and understand that too much of these amino acids could be a problem for any one of these individuals who has one of these genetic disorders. And if anybody who's listening here might, who might be a nutritionist or a registered dietitian, you probably learned this in your training with regards to some of these inborn errors in metabolism and why you know, high protein diets and some of these kids can be quite dangerous. Okay, so valine, isoleucine, leucine, right? So we've been focusing on isoleucine because isoleucine gets converted to ty uh, tygo uh, coenzyme A. It becomes methyl um, acetoacetyl coenzyme A, and that eventually gets converted to propanyl coenzyme A. So this was, came from a paper that was specifically looking at beta ketophilase deficiencies, right? And we know that this guy over here can become tigalyl glycine, right? So that becomes elevated when there is some kind of blockage downstream. But let's focus right here, Pro, uh, propionyl coenzyme A through something called propionic acidemia. And just follow this through, notice that propionyl coenzyme A becomes methylmalonyl coenzyme A in its D form and its L form, which can then become succinyl coenzyme A. And succinyl coenzyme A goes off into the Krebs cycle. This is just another view, a different camera angle of this reaction. So here is the end, let's just focus on isoleucine. The end result in this reaction is propanyl coenzyme A that then gets converted to D-methylmalonyl coenzyme A, gets converted to L-methylmalonyl coenzyme A that eventually becomes succinyl coenzyme A to engage the Krebs cycle. So it's another entry point into the Krebs cycle. Now, a couple interesting side notes, right, is that a biotin deficiency, biotin is needed, okay, by our propanyl coenzyme A carboxylase to convert propanyl coenzyme A into D-methylmalonyl coenzyme A. And you can actually look at an organic acid test and get a sense of biotin deficiency by an elevation of a chemical called methyl citric acid. If we have a B12 deficiency, specifically in the form of adenosylcobalamin, that can cause an elevation of methylmalonic acid, uh, methylmalonic acid. And it could just be a B12 deficiency that can lead to an adenosylcobalamin deficiency. So we know that a B12 deficiency can cause methylmalonic acid elevation. That too could be picked up off the organic acid test and a biotin deficiency could end up causing propionic acid acidemia. If it's severe enough, you can start to back things up the chain. And if it were severe enough, it could end up itself contributing to elevations of the tigalyl glycine marker. So here's just a different view. Here's our methyl citric indicating a biotin deficiency. Okay, that fits in right here. So biotin helps convert propanyl coenzyme A to D-methylmalonyl coenzyme A, and then it goes down to become succinyl coenzyme A, right? And right here is our B12. So a B12 deficiency and a biotin deficiency could affect the production of succinyl coenzyme A, which then could compromise our Krebs cycle. Right, so propionic acidemia, which occurs about one in 500,000 live births, could be another contributing factor to elevations of uh, tiglyl glycine, right? So that fits in right here. And that can occur because, again, of a biotin problem or just some kind of genetic problem in the converting enzyme.
And so again, when you sort of pull the camera lens back a bit and take a little bit of a broader view, we, we understand that fats, carbs, and protein, certain amino acids through different chemical reactions get funneled down to different chemicals like acetyl coenzyme A and succinyl coenzyme A to enter the Krebs cycle at different locations. But ultimately as they do, and we're moving from one step to the next in the Krebs cycle, we're producing other chemicals like NADH that cross over to engage the electron transport chain for the eventual production of the ATP. But we can also understand that each step requires an enzyme which could have its own problem and that many of these enzymes require certain nutrients or cofactors to engage in the process that could also then compromise the sequence of events biochemically. And so if we block things down low, okay, or midpoint or, or higher up, if it were severe enough, in this particular case, looking at isoleucine, for example, it might cause a crossover, or at least it might cause a slight elevation of that tigloglycine marker. Generally, the closer you get to the sequence of events to where that Thai glial coenzyme A marker is, the more of an impact you're going to have on the Thai glial glycine elevation. All right, so a lot of times when it comes to studying this material, you just have to stare at these sequences to just let it sink in. It, it's the stuff is not, it's not easy. It's not always intuitive. Um, it's hard to get a big picture of biochemistry because when we're trying to study it, you're usually looking at things from slide to slide or you're looking at things from page to page in a textbook. But the more you do it, the more you chase after it, the better you get at it. You can start to see the connecting points. And it's just another layer that we can add to our clinical insight into things when we're working with chemical tests like this, or we're working with the organic acids or we're working with you know, other types of laboratory assessments that we might be doing. So again, leucine, isoleucine, valine. Now on the organic acid test, there, these, these markers right here, this 2-keto, 3-methyl N-valeric, the 2-keto isovaleric and the keto isocaproic, there's about five markers in the first under the amino acid metabolite section of the organic acid test that are actually linked to issues up high, I say up high, sort of at the top end of the initiating phase of these chemical reactions that are linked to leucine, isoleucine and valine imbalances. And a lot of times it comes down to problems affecting this particular enzyme. It's called, it's a branch chain keto, uh, keto acid dehydrogenase complex, this enzyme right here. And you'll notice that this enzyme is really important for leucine, isoleucine, and valine to initiate its activity to get us sort of that second level, right? This 2-methylbutyryl coenzyme A with regards to isoleucine. And you notice right below that is our tigloglycine coenzyme A marker. These markers are not very commonly elevated on the organic acid test. And, and typically if they are, it would most commonly have to do with problems in this enzyme, not something really below that, below this biochemically. But again, if it were a severe enough problem, okay, whether we block something at this level or we block something at this level, there might, and I say might, be a reflection of this chemical seen on the organic acid test under the amino acid section. Not very common, okay? It's much more common, again, to see peer elevations of, of tigloglycine that are seen off the GPL tox profile that don't really have any reflection of what we would see on the organic acid test, which brings us back to the fact that 
the most common reason that tigloglycine is elevated, okay, on the organic acid, excuse me, off the GPL tox profile is because of issues happening in the electron transport chain, most likely from chemical exposure, oxidative stress, or certain nutritional issues. And then go back real quick. Okay, so again, I just, I know this is, if you're looking at some of this stuff for the first time. So again, these amino acids all funnel down, right? To make chemicals that help to engage cellular metabolism. So the acetyl coenzyme A, for example, enters right here at step one. Succinyl coenzyme A enters further down in the chain reaction. So again, there's multiple entry points into our Krebs cycle coming off of other chemical reactions. That ultimately leads to a production of ATP. And then that reaction or that ability to make ATP occurs because of proper electron transport between the different complexes. And then of course, proper conversion of chemicals like CoQ10, for example, in its sequence, ultimately to help us produce ATP at an abundant level. But again, if we damage these complexes in various ways, that ultimately is gonna compromise ATP production. There are various toxins that are known, well-researched, well-referenced that are electron transport inhibitors, things specifically that can damage complex one. So like this chemical here called pyrocytin, and this is a, a metabolite of a certain type of, of organism called actinomycetes. Um, I think it, I can't remember if it's a certain type of, I'm drawing a blank right now on what type of bacteria it's related to or groups of bacteria it's related to. But it shows you that certain microbial toxins might be an inhibitor. Amatol is a sedative, it's a barbiturate. Rhodonone is a pesticide. I, I guess it's actually a natural pesticide. Sometimes they'll add it to ponds or lakes, for example, to kill off certain fish that are considered to be invasive in a, a certain uh, aquatic environment. <clears throat> Cyanide. Okay, so cyanide poisoning takes out complex four. So does carbon monoxide. So that's kind of interesting. Carbon monoxide poisoning leads to a shutdown of the electron transport chain by damaging complex four. And this particular one, this um, attractylicide, this is a toxic compound that is found in certain plants like uh, the daisy family. I guess they use this for certain traditional medicinal purposes or you know, religious purposes, for example. But you know, it will certainly damage the ability to make ATP. But one of the other things I want to bring your attention to is mycotoxin, so aflatoxin. So aflatoxin M1, for example, which is found on the GPL mycotox profile, is also a damager of mitochondrial activity or specifically electron transport chain activity. So that, I think that's interesting uh, information to kind of hold on to when you're starting looking at the organic acid test, for example. Okay, so ultimately it's about thinking critically, thinking clinically, you know, the type of patient you're working with, their clinical presentation, um, the genetic causes of Tiglo-glycine uh, elevations are rare. Okay, so through all of that, those are rare problems. Um, again, most of them occurring anywhere between one in 5,000 to one in a million you know, births, for example. So not something that we'd likely commonly see. It really comes down to the most common reasons that this is high 
is because of toxic insult by environmental factors, um, nutritional deficiencies, inflammation, oxidative stress. And so at the end of the day, what we can do while we're trying to help our patient, you know, identify where the chemical exposures are coming from and again, detoxification, et cetera, is just do some good nutrient support, some foundational support to help support cell function so that we're bolstering these, these pathways a little bit more robustly with, you know, our supplements, whether it's biotin, whether it's CoQ10, whether it's B vitamins, for example, all of it can be supportive and helpful. So I hope you enjoyed that and maybe use some of that as you move forward in practice, um, at least just to kind of have a, a, a deeper appreciation for some of the biochemistry. Now we get into these topics in very great detail in our organic acid test training through my Integrated Medicine Academy. So we actually have an advanced oat mastery course, which goes through every marker on the organic acid test. And then we also have a foundational course called the Essential Oat Mastery Course that you can learn about the fundamental aspects of oat implementation into your practice. Both of those courses, you can get more information at their respective websites. We also have a Toxicity Mastery Course, which gets into toxins from mold, mycotoxins, chemicals, heavy metals in great detail. A Toxicity Mastery Course is a really interesting fun course to participate in that also is available through our Integrated Medicine Academy. If you are a healthcare practitioner, we do have a membership website, Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, where you can join. We have one-on-one -on -one consultation um, availability for lab consults, case analysis, clinical troubleshooting, et cetera. There's also a lot of educational material in this website as well. This website is not a course, it is a membership site for just ongoing support for healthcare practitioners. If you're interested in ordering some of these lab tests, there is a website called Lab Test Plus that provides access to many of the Great Plains labs, the organic acid test, the GPL tox, the mycotox profile, and each lab actually comes with a written interpretation of the relevant findings. So more information at labtestplus.com. You can email questions to labtestplus at gmail.com. And for all of our other courses through Integrated Medicine Academy, you can go to integrativemedicineacademy.com. Or if you have questions, you can email us at integrativemedicineacademy at gmail.com. And then I'm also available for private consultations through my private practice. Our website is my sunrisecenter.com. There's the phone number and email. Okay, everybody, thank so much for your participation. It's been my pleasure again to present uh, information here for the Great Plains Laboratory webinars. I'm Dr. Kurt Wooler. Thanks so much.